Hebron, and he had to go through that mountain to get up to Damascus and cross over. So it was really kind of cool and crisp, and people were out running around doing what they had to do still even. And so he was bent with his plan to go to Damascus. You know the rest of the story. <laughs> because see what happened is that Paul had a distinct plan, his plan, his plan to go take care of what he thought he thought was important. But what did our Lord Jesus say? No, I don't think so, Saul. And he's knocked him right off his horse and later on he became Paul. He was changed by that conversion. He was changed by that divine plan that took place in Saul's life to the point where he was knocked off his high horse and brought low to the glory of God. And he actually spoke to Jesus and Jesus said, why are you persecuting me, Paul? At that time it was Saul. And Saul said, here I am. And then he became probably the most ardent and fervent of the disciples of Jesus in the book of Acts where Paul went and spread the word not only to fellow Jews but he was the main person that enabled the Gentiles to hear the word and brought Gentiles, us, into salvation because we're all Gentiles, believe it or not, we're not Jews in here but we're Gentiles but above all if you've accepted Christ into your heart, you are a part of the body of Christ. You are a son and daughter of the great almighty God. You are saved and you will then go to glory the time that you die. Praise God. Amen. That's what we can rest on. That's what we can sit there and understand it as we walk day by day. He's with us. So what I'm looking at today is the title of the lesson, of the message I should say, that deals with man's plans. And it falls right in line with a couple quick questions. What plans are more important to you? God's plans or your own? Do you realize and fully depend upon God's plans for you? Or do you seem to lean on your own plan and think that's the way to go? So the bottom line is that we plan for many events in our lives. You plan to come to church today. We make many plans and, and sometimes we go astray and make our plans the main deal, the presidents that takes over everything. Our plans are no other way. And when we do that, that is wrong. That is a sin. When we think that our plans and our ways are better than God's ways and God's plans, I think we can agree with that. But the bottom line is that our plans must align with God's plans. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. How does that happen? How do we enable our plans to become God's plans? How do we see that God's plans are, are indeed for our betterment and not to make us go into a bad way? So to begin, we're going to look at Proverbs 16.9, just one verse that kind of guides us along today's message. And Proverbs 16.9 says this, and you can turn to it in your Bibles if you want. You, some might even have this memorized already. Proverbs 16.9 says, In their hearts, humans plan their course. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Amen. It is a key idea. One verse speaks a lot of what's happening even today as it was back then, that man will plan in their hearts what they want to do. <laughs> but then God says, no, I'm the one that establishes those steps. Amen. And that's why we have to work as Christians to know what that means. I like what the translation, there's a little uh, translation called, book called uh, The Message that says that, and that it says that we plan the way we want to live but only God makes it uh, makes us able to live it in that way. 
but it's kind of interesting how our plans seem to sometimes just uh, take precedence. But also you can find out that sometimes our plans are interrupted by God's divine purpose. And that begs the question, when our plans get interrupted or changed by God's divine purpose, do we actively seek to see how those unscheduled events, those unscheduled changes work to further God's glory? And how they work to provide a means by which we can understand God's purpose in our lives. See, what we have to understand, the bottom line here, is that God is in control. Catch this. God is in control, and we are not. Amen. That's the bottom line. Man's plans hold, they just don't hold any water against God's plans. And you think of the biblical greats when you kind of gaze back on man's plans, the biblical greats, and how their plans went awry from God's plans, and then what God did in response. And you could probably recount right now as we're thinking about, okay, God's plans over man's plans in the Bible. Hmm. Let's think of somebody. Oh, how about Jonah? Ha. Jonah had a plan. I'm not going to Nineveh. Those guys don't deserve to know about God's grace and love. Matter of fact, I could care less about Nineveh. They can just go away. So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go and do my own plan, said Jonah. So Jonah hopped in a boat and later out found himself in a big old fish. And he's wondering, huh, I think my plan has changed. <laughs> and it did. God's plan took over Jonah's plan. And of course, you know the rest of the story there on that also. Man's plans taken over by God's plans. Yes, indeed. Think of some other ones. Oh, we just talked about one guy already. Saul or Paul. Because we knew that Saul was bent on destroying anything dealing with Jesus and that new church. Paul said, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm planning on it the best of my ability to not let that, that happen. And what happened to Paul? On the way to Damascus, he had a change in plans to the point where it blinded him. And he had to have the people from the way help him back. You think of some others that had made plans in the New Testament. I think of all of us. And I think of the prodigal son. See, the prodigal son had a plan, didn't he? What was the prodigal son's plan? He was going to take his inheritance, go to a distant land, have a grand and great time, and continue to live life large. How did that work out? Well, you see how God's plans took over and said, you're going to suffer a famine. You're going to be eating the pods of, of what the pigs themselves are eating. And you're going to come to your senses, young man, and realize I have to return back to my father and say, I am wrong. Take me back. Even as a slave, dad, bring me back. So there was a change of plans. God's plan was to go ahead and answer that father's prayer because that father of that prodigal was out in the front of his house every night looking down the road waiting for his son to come back. Next day, back out there waiting for his son to come back. Next day, out there waiting for his son every day. Just like our Lord waits for us to come back to him. And what is interesting is that that father, when he saw his son coming down the road, did not turn his back and say, well, I guess you finally figured out what was right and what was wrong. No, that father ran to his son, open-armed, and brought him in and restored him to full sonship. Sounds like us, doesn't it? Because there's times when we rebel and we go our own way and we think we know that's what it's supposed to be and we go on our own plan and God says, no, come back to me my arms are open wide. Repent, my son. Ask for forgiveness. And you will be saved. 
Amen. And that is a, an example of what it means when man's plans are put off to one side. But then we look at what is God's plans. And we see time and time again examples of God's plans in the Old Testament. You know what happened was, if you're a, an Israelite historian that likes to study Jewish history, you all know that Israel was at one time a very strong nation. But then man's plans got in the way and that nation split in two. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. Because of man's plans that took, uh, took uh, and actually occurred. But God had other plans. He enabled and, and uh, allowed Israel and Judah to be taken over by Assyria and also Babylon. And they were exiled for many, many years, this nation. But then God threw out a promise in Jeremiah, who was the main prophet of mainly Judah at that point in time. And Jeremiah said, God had promised you guys that you're going to be in exile, but he also promised you to, that you would be able to come back. But what Jeremiah was fighting was that there was a lot of false prophets out there also saying that Babylon's going to be weak and you're going to be back here soon and don't worry about God. This is just what's happening in the world. And Jeremiah said, no, no, no. The Lord told me this. And this is what the Lord told Jeremiah. If you will, in your Bibles, go ahead and turn into Jeremiah. Go into Jeremiah. We're still in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 29. You've heard this verse before because it's one of my favorites. And I always say it, so you're going to have to bear with me. <laughs> but Jeremiah 29, 11, and you go into 13, it all talks about this promise of restoration, much like the prodigal son coming back. But here's God's plans being brought out in Scripture by a prophet named Jeremiah where he said to the people of Judah and Israel at that point in time, 29, I'll go up to verse 10 and bring us into a context here. Jeremiah 29.10 says, This is what the Lord says. And this is Jeremiah talking. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, that being Jerusalem. So let's continue on in verse 11. Here's where it says this great, this great verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Can you imagine that? That great and awesome almighty God, the creator of all the universe, has plans for each one of us. Individually. He knows us. Intimately. And He has a plan for each one of us. So what's this plan that God has for us, you're saying, you're asking. What is that, Ed? Plans for me to come to Round Mountain Baptist Church on Sunday morning? That could be part of it. But the plans He has, it says here, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Wow. And we don't deserve that. But he gives it to us. That's God's plans over man's plans. But you know, when it comes to these promises, there's always a certain condition. And then we see as we read further into Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 13. In verse 12, it says this. Then you will call on me and I will and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So dear ones, when you come and pray, you can rest assured without a doubt that when you call on God and come and pray to him, he will listen to you. Amen. I've never seen my Lord when I come to pray 
ever turn a blind eye or even a deaf ear to me. And I'm nothing special. I'm just little Ed. But God loves me, which makes me special. Amen. But that means that I need to seek Him. I need to delight in Him. I need to commit my ways to Him because in so doing, He then draws close to me. And if I seek Him, I will find Him. I don't want to live a life being lost in God's eyes or being lost trying to find my Lord. I want to have Him straight away in my eyesight. And trust me, my eyesight's not all that great. So when I see and understand that he's there, it's a comfort. It's a comfort for each one of us as we come and pray to him and seek him. Because he listens, he loves us, he forgives us. See, the bottom line here too, when it comes to God's plans, is this. God is in control and we are not. God is in control and we are not. So how do we align with God's plans? Seek is one, yeah. I mean, all you guys probably have an idea. How do I align then with God's plans? Because if you're a Christian that are really, that's really seeking God, you want to make sure you please Him. In order to please God, you have to sit there and be in a relationship with our Almighty Father. So that in everything you say, think, and do, it's for His glory and aligned with His will and not our own. And that's a tough thing to do because we've been brought up as Americans, we've been brought up as men and women to sit there and pull up our bootstraps and take care of ourselves and do what we have to do for ourselves. And that's a good thing. But we also need to make sure we fully depend upon our Lord because He loves us and He wants to take care of us in ways we don't even expect or understand sometimes. But he's there. And I've told everyone in here, and I'm going to say it again, a challenge. Make sure you grab yourself a life verse, a verse you come to all the time when you're in trouble, that you can memorize and recant right off the bat. When you're facing temptation, go to your life verse. When you're facing a trial or, or a trouble, go to your life verse. When you're happy and joyous, go to your life verse. Do you have a life verse? Is there a verse you go to right off the bat that you have memorized? And if you don't, do it. Find a verse and memorize it. Even if it's Psalms 23, 1. That's a good one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How hard was that? Amen. But it's a very endearing and very personal verse. The Lord is my shepherd. And so we have to make sure that we guide on that and follow that. <clears throat> My life verse is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That's my life verse. You can see I just kind of go through right that and say it. Matt, you had something? Well, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I feel like I never give up <laughs> mm -hmm. because uh, one time uh, I saw this shepherd my church mm -hmm. and uh, it's great shepherd and God is good. <laughs> yep. Now it says also when we look at in Psalms 37.4 it's a good thing talking about aligning our plans with God's plans. That's another one that I would say you might want to write down in your, in your bulletin. Is Psalms 37, verse 4. I'm going to get to it here. You can turn to it also. It says in Psalms 37, 4, it says... Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. So in order to align with God's plans, make sure you delight in God's plans. Make sure that you look forward to it. 
See, we align our plans with God's plans by three major things, I would say. First off, we need to make sure that we plan and make our plans with the purpose of God in mind. So when you're making plans, you think, is this going to be something that's going to benefit or is going to be aligned with God's will? That's a good plan to follow. And when you determine your plans and make your plans, make sure that your plans are bathed in prayer and quiet time. That's a hard thing for me sometimes. Sometimes I'll go, it's just, I think it's the army in me. I've done it for 20 some years. I just go forward and do what I have to do and make it, make it happen. But I need to make sure that when I make my plans, that I pray about those decisions. Because we all make decisions every day. And you kind of wonder, the last decision, the last major decision you made, did you actually ask God to help you out with that decision? I sometimes forget to do that. I'll confess that to y'all, because I love you. And I think you love me. So, you know, <laughs> this is the thing that you have to do, is bathe that in prayer. And then, here's the key one, is that you have to be open to God's plans, maybe changing your own plans. And I'm going to finalize today in the message is that when we think about our salvation and when you came to Christ, did you plan on doing that? Was there a specific time that you did that? You're saying, okay, at uh, 7.30 at night, I'm going to Round Mountain Baptist Church. I'm going to talk to Pastor Ed and I'm going to be saved. It's rare when that happens. When I was saved, I had no idea that when I went to early First Baptist Church on a Sunday evening, Diane was back home with her, with her parents at the time, uh, on vacation, I think it was. But on, in May of 79, I went to the church just saying, hey, I'm going to go to church Sunday night just to see what's going on. Had no idea. Didn't have any plan at all about coming to Christ. I just wanted to be a part of something that night because I was bored. And so I went to church and I was saved. Amen. And so, you know, that was my plan being cast aside and God's plan taking precedence. And so we have to be open to how God moves. We have to be open to hearing and seeing how the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And by that then, we can see how our plans can then be brought underneath God's plans. Strive to do that as you go through your walk with God. Because you're going to be making all sorts of plans and decisions in your life. That's a part of being a human being. That's a part of being around. But you have to make sure that as a child of God, let his plans take precedence over everything. But the key thing that has to be done when it comes to decisions, the key eternal decision is that if you're lost, if you've not accepted Christ into your heart as Savior by faith, that decision must take precedence and must be foremost in your thoughts. If you know somebody that's lost, the decision and plan should be in line with God's plan to share the love of Christ with that person. It doesn't have to be something grandiose or some major production. It could be simply quietly saying, this is what Jesus did for me this week. What has Jesus done for you? Or, you know, a funny thing happened to me. This happened and it was just really a bad situation. But, you know, Jesus brought me through that situation. Can you think of a time when you've had any type of bad situations that it turned out okay? Just ask him that question. And you say, oh yeah, I remember this had and this and this happened. And you can say, well, could have been because Jesus was there bringing you through it. You know, allow the Holy Spirit to work in your hearts. Just like Paul and Peter and John and Matthew and all the big disciples, they allowed the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that's in you, to work through and, and talk to those to be <clears throat> brought to know about God's love. I mean, I love what Cheryl Lynn says, that we should pray for the lost. And, and what, what Moe's talk about when it comes to her praying for, for the lost. And Chris has brought that up also with family members. We all have family members that need to be saved. I think. 
if they're not immediately immediate families, there's going to be distant family members that need to be brought into Christ. And our purpose, our purpose as Christians is to be able to share the love of Christ and to serve Him in such a way. Because there's not too many effective secret agent Christians around. If you have a secret agent card, you need to tear it up, get a brand new card and say, I'm alive and well and, and speaking loud Christian card <laughs> with your name on it. Then on the back, there's the Romans Road. Matter of fact, they're in the back table. We have a back there. If you want to pick up some of those tracks we have back there. <clears throat> but I'm closing now. We're going to go into the Lord's Supper. Matt. Yeah. Um, I want to share something. Okay. You want to come up here? You can come up here. You can speak right there. Yeah, you can speak right here. Come up here. You got it. Let's see. <laughs> okay. When the Lord told me, double shy. <laughs> are, you, are you, are you get it? Because, yeah, my, my life, I was scared of thunderstorms and not me. Because Jesus, Always. Life for you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and close with some prayer, then we'll go into our Lord's Supper and um, go from there. So, Father, thank you for uh, your love. Thank you for uh, your word, what it means to us, for allowing us to uh, share your love. Give us the opportunities, Father, and allow us to see those opportunities to share uh, what it means to be a child of yours, to be saved. And if there's somebody even in this room now, Father, that needs to either be saved, accept you as Lord and Savior in, into your heart, let it be so, Father, we pray. If there's somebody in here that needs to rekindle that fire of, of being a brand new Christian and, and and be alive for you. Make that so also. And Father, once again, we lift up this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <coughs>